Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Darcy Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, July 9th, and we will hear the presentation Digital Public Participation in Bogota, a case study using Street Mix. Next slide here. Uh, for technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box in your GoToWebinar tool panel. For content questions related to the presentation, just type those in the chat box again in your GoToWebinar tool panel, uh, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. But of course, if you have a question, a clarification question, or want some more information um, as our panelist is going through uh, um, the Street Mix platform, feel free to just type your question in right away and we might just interrupt him uh, as we go throughout the presentation. So don't feel like you have to wait till the end to come up with that question. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2021. Thanks to all of those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, we're sponsored by APA Technology Division. Thanks to you for sponsoring. And if you have any questions or are interested in joining the division, we urge you to email them at apatechdivision at gmail.com. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. Uh, this is through July. Be sure to head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast to register for these sessions. Uh, we're actually booked through November. We have, I think, two December dates available. Um, so be sure to head over to our webcast webpage and the coming weeks uh, we'll have information and registration links available for our August sessions coming soon. Uh, this session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. To log your AICP CM credits, just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's uh, title or event number, both of which can be found again on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And make sure you like us on Facebook, just search Planning Webcast Series and we'll pop up. That's where I post any important or timely information like date or time changes. And also when we have new sessions available for you to register. So be sure to like us on Facebook. And we record all of our sessions and post them up on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube and we'll pop up. Uh, make sure you subscribe to us because then you'll get notified when I post new session recordings up onto our YouTube channel. We have well over, I think, 350 recorded sessions. So you can search for specific topics and uh, we have them all there available for you. We'll also have a PDF copy of today's session available on our webcast webpage at the conclusion. Again, all the information you need is at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. That is the end of my housekeeping items. Uh, so with that, I am going to change the presenter mode over to today's speaker, Carlos Pardo. Okay, I just turned those controls over to you, Carlos. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to APA for inviting me to do this. I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, as you heard, I'm I'm happy to get uh, questions as I speak. And then uh, you can interrupt me, Christine, whenever we you you feel that I've been talking on for a very long time. I'm planning on talking for less than one hour and then uh, taking on any other remaining questions around this. And I'm going to be using a presentation, but also a few websites that I want to show you as we move forward. So. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, everything that we have done with Street Mix and what we did specifically in the case of Bogota, which was a, to my mind, very interesting uh, experience in doing participation with Street Mix. So, first of all, I'm going to tell you where I'm coming from. Uh, there's something called the shared mobility principles for livable cities. I encourage everybody to go to that website and look for that. Uh, because it's very interesting and, and we're also very happy uh, 
to know that they exist. They were created by Robin Chase, and then she sat down with 10 organizations who launched them. And now it has more than 200 organizations that have signed them because they're sort of what should we do in this future where it seems like we'll have flying cars and many other things, but we really don't know how to manage that. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later as well. Uh, so I work with NUMO, which is the New Urban Mobility Alliance. Uh, we are a global alliance that is channeling the tech-based disruptions in urban transport. And then we look to create joyful cities and we think about sustainability, fairness, and that new normal. Of course, the term new normal has had very different meanings in the past three years. When we began in NUMO in 2019, it meant one thing. Then with a lot of equity and anti-racism concerns, it it started to, to mean an additional thing. And then with COVID, it, it ended up becoming sort of this mix of everything. And we're trying to sort of understand what happens there. How can we support uh, uh, sustainable development and sustainable transport in terms of uh, addressing those disruptions properly? So many of you may have seen this. It's the inverted pyramid that has been used a lot in transport planning. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of a twist of that pyramid, uh, but this is sort of the typical modes of transport that you normally see in the pyramid. But what we found is that it's getting more crowded. Like we're starting to see many more vehicles, services, things that we just don't even know what they are. So we really need to start to understand how can we address this? Where can we allow them to ride, for example? And in general, what should we do in order to really preserve uh, a fair allocation of street, mix, a street space, for example, uh, fair pricing of different mobility services and all that kind of thing? So that's sort of the discussion that we're having in NUMO. And we've seen that sort of this, this micro mobility explosion is one of those things that have made us understand that. Uh, these disruptions are real. They are generating a lot of questions in us, like where do they fit? Do they fit? Don't they fit? Uh, what about people who trip over the scooters that are left in the middle of the sidewalk? Uh, what should we do about that? But then that also informs us in sort of many of the other things that are going to happen or have started to happen uh, in sort of the future of mobility. Uh, the same goes with my transit and micro transit. The same goes for right hailing and, and pooling. Uh, so all of these we've started to try and understand to sort of see what happens with the infrastructure, with the attitudes towards these services, right? Relations, performance, data sharing, like many of these things. And then can we plan ahead for the strange things that may come? I, I sort of proposed at the very beginning of NUMA that we should have the magic carpet everywhere. Uh, and everybody was like, well, you, that's strange. Why do we need a magic carpet? Like that's like that's sort of stupid, basically. But then I said, like, look, really, really understand that we're going to have a lot of different transport services. Every two months, there is a video on YouTube or Twitter or somewhere that's proving my point because it's showing somebody doing something strange with a new vehicle that nobody ever heard of. Uh, the most recent, which is some guy flying across Times Square, I think, in some uh, unrecognized, unverified vehicle. So this is the kind of thing that we have to sort of prepare for and respond to that. So that's basically what we do in NUMO. I mean, in addition to that, we do many other things. We sort of reflect on the trips that uh, are happening, like 52% of trips in the US are shorter than three miles. That is incredible. I mean, I never expected that to be a fact. But the more importantly, of those shorter trips, 73% are done by car, which again is surprising or not surprising, depending on, on your history of, of how you've seen transportation. So we really sort of, this is one of the things that we say, well, we, what if we shifted all those trips to shared mobility? Uh, so in NUMA, what we do is that we engage people, we experiment, we, de we define pilots to experiment, we empower organizations, people, key stakeholders and so that we can inform that new normal. Um, I'm, I'm working mostly in the pilots and in the different platforms and tools that we develop to sort of help in understanding that new normal. And I'm going to describe a few of those uh, you may have or may have not heard of them. One is the mobility 
card game, which I can send to you uh, if you write me nicely, uh, but you can also get the digital version and play with your friends online in this strange COVID-led uh, reality that we're still living. Uh, we also, in addition to, to a card game, we're also sort of working on mobility helps. Actually, this morning we launched or we helped launch the, the pilot that we did in Pittsburgh for shared mobility and 50 mobility hubs. Uh, I could go on about each of these for hours. We're trying to do things like mobility wallets where you give a person $300 and see how they're moving throughout the month. And they may keep the $300, they may keep just a little bit, depending on the type of mode of transfer that they're using. And we're also working with Lego, not with Lego, with Lego blocks to try and do something uh, sort of to understand how to use them in, in sort of presenting arguments around a uh, new mobility. Again, COVID has made it difficult to play with Lego with more than yourself. Uh, so we, we haven't been working so much around that. Uh, and then just because I think it's super interesting, uh, we developed a tool to that I call the periodic table of mobility, which is uh, something that can show you whether a magic carpet or anything from uh, uh, the DeLorean of uh, Back to the Future to a car, where can they go? Where should they go? What data should they be required uh, uh, to provide to government? Uh, also happy to send you links to all of these things uh, after I talk. Uh, but I'm going to talk mostly about street mix in the rest of the time that I have. Uh, so many of you may already have played around a lot with street mix. I found out about it in my previous job when I was working in an NGO in Colombia uh, uh, in 2013, which is when they launched. It is a wonderful platform. I, I really like I'm like a salesman for them. I, I love it. I want everybody to use it. Uh, and of course, the first thing that I did, or maybe the second thing that I did when I arrived at Numo, then I said, well, we have to support them. We have to sort of talk to them and see how we can make this thing even better. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward platform. I'm just going to go out of my presentation just to show you. I mean, if you haven't been there, it's sort of streetmix.net. You just have a street, and then you say, well, I don't want to have this car here. I actually want to have a food truck and then I don't want this truck. I want to have tram or light rail and then I don't want to have parking. And I actually want to have this narrower, this wider, and I want to put some street lighting here. And and you can redesign a street, right? The more interesting thing is that not only that, but you can uh, change the characteristics of each of these uh, things in the street. And if you log in, which is actually a free uh, process, you get more things, which I'll show you in a, in a short while. Uh, but it's an open source platform. You can actually go to the GitHub website and deploy your own flavor of Street Mix. Uh, and the essential thing about it is that it makes it very easy for anybody to propose changes to streets, as I just showed you it's extremely easy to put anything there, even a COVID street or even a temporary barrier. Like you can put any of these things there and you don't need to hire an architect to do this. Apologies to all the architects who, who do this a little bit for a living, but, but this actually complements the work of architects because it can give people a much better understanding very quickly. And then you can get the architects to do a much nicer design of the street that they're doing. So that's street mix. I mean, in a very, very quick nutshell, uh, I'm going to go back to this presentation to continue talking about uh, sort of what we're doing. One crucial thing about street mix is that each street is basically a line of code. So it is, it is, it is basically programming. It is one line that says you put building here, uh, then you put sidewalk here, then you put tree, then you put that, blah, 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 and then you characterize each of those. How wide is it? What is the amount of people that is there? What is the direction of the street? Like all that. But it is a line of code in the end. It's not a drawing. It is a line of code that produces the drawing. And I, I, I needed to, to sort of emphasize that before I went on because most of the things that we did with Street Mix and Bogota relate to that. So what, what Numo has done, like, no, like Street Mix existed before Numo. It already worked really well before Numo uh, came in. 
Uh, but then in 2019, as I mentioned, we said, okay, look, we have to add more things here. So we said, let's do four things. Let's add the street capacity. Let's add uh, autonomous vehicles. Let's add a magic carpet. And let's help StreetMix revamp the database structure. And in 2020, we helped uh, with ITDP to add the bus rapid transit bus and the station. And I'll, I'll go on and then explain the Septima thing that we did uh, at the end of last year. But just to summarize sort of graphically, we added this, which is showing the, the uh, below the capacity of the street. Then we added uh, the AV, the magic carpet, and then above you can also see the capacity. I'm going to show this in the actual uh, platform. So this is the uh, capacity of the street. It tells you the total capacity of the street I just designed. And it also tells you the individual capacity of each of the uh, modes that you have there. So for example, if, if you're, so it's 63,000 as I have it here, but if I say, well, this street will only have cars here. Uh, oh, I had never seen this new car. This is a new car, it's a micro van. Okay, so it has this car. And then let's say that I'm going to go really crazy about the car names. So I take everything else out. There's no people. And I end up having a lot of lanes, but only 9,000 passengers per hour per direction and potentially up to 12,000. So you can see that this is very directly, very explicitly telling you in this width of this place, depending on what you have there, you have higher or lower capacity. So that to me was very important to have in the platform of StreetMix. And that's sort of what we supported them in, in developing. They've done a lot more things in the meantime, both before and after we came on board. We've been working with them uh, since 2019 in many different things. I really like working with uh, StreetMix. And then at the end of 2019, the government in Bogota, which is where I'm from, if you've already noticed it's from my strange accent, uh, in Bogota, in Colombia, we have an avenue called the Septima, which is the seventh avenue. And it is incredibly important because it has 22 kilometers, or let's say 17 miles, more or less. And it crosses every level of income in the city, from the very poor to the very rich. This place right here, where I took this picture, is a financial center of Bogota very close to where many senators, congressmen, very powerful people in the country and in the city live. Uh, so the government said, well, we have to redesign the street because the street is pretty old. We need to uh, improve uh, the transit services that we have there. Uh, because of COVID, it actually had this emergency bikeway that I loved since the beginning that they did it. Uh, but then government said, well, we really need to do something very participatory. So they asked me like what I thought could be done. And I said, well, we can just use street mix and then we can figure it out in the way. <laughs> the figuring it out in the way was that we actually deployed uh, uh, a new version of street mix that was a much more potent version of street mix because we had the capability of producing analytics of all the streets that we have. So, I'm going to start describing this now. So basically what we have is each person, as I said, can design one street. And uh, as you can see here, so for example, these four people were doing their specific versions of a street and each of those specific versions of the street would be transformed into lines of code. Those lines of code were very easy, well, very easy. <laughs> If you have a good programmer, for them, it's very easy to translate this into an Excel sheet. And based on that Excel sheet, with all the street that you have, you can start doing some analytics of how many people propose something with a bus, how many people propose something here with a bikeway, how many bikeways do we have, what are the percentage of people that have proposed an autonomous vehicle lane in these uh, uh, streets. So this was basically the exercise, the exercise that we were able to do. We were able to get thousands of, or theoretically millions of proposals on the streets into a spreadsheet where we could do an analysis of all this. So that was the, 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 
the essence of the exercise that we came up with. And of course, one of the more difficult things was getting the word out. So this was October, 2020, deep in the lockdown. So in, in Colombia, we still were in very deep lockdown by October, 2020. All of this was done online. I didn't go anywhere. The programmers didn't go anywhere. Uh, so it was mostly through Twitter, email, print and online newspaper articles like the one that you see on the left, which was actually a full page spread in the first page of the Bogota section in the major newspaper of the country. And some very few, I have to admit, in-person workshops were places where uh, people were directed to the website. We could not do in-person workshops to play with the platform uh, because we were very worried that, well, COVID basically. And despite the fact that we did have an idea of how we could do safe in-person workshops, uh, it was anyway risky. And, and we felt that it wasn't a, a, a problem to sort of, how can we uh, get these people to really participate? When we began this, I said, well, let's hope that we get a hundred proposals, right? Uh, because of course it's very difficult to get, I mean, if, if any of you have done participatory things, like getting a hundred is sort of your, when you say, okay, it wasn't a complete disaster, it was just fine, we got a hundred. Uh, we ended up getting uh, in two weeks, almost 7,000 proposals. That was an average of 480 proposals per day. I equated that to 650 hours of work from people of, of the city, of the of citizens. And out of those, 91% of the proposals were valid. That means that 91% of the proposals made sense. Like you could look at them and you could say, okay, this could be a street. Like the one that you see below makes sense. It, it sort of doesn't have cars, but it makes sense. Like you could have a street like this. There's many streets like this uh, in many different cities of the world. So once we adjusted everything, we had 5,941 valid streets until Halloween, which was the date that we put as an ending. But anyway, people continue to, propose, to do proposals. So we analyzed 6,093 uh, proposals that came uh, as of November 3rd. And that was a pretty interesting thing. Like we, we really got a lot of people uh, uh, participating. We really got a lot of uh, proposals that I felt were, were great. We did a lot of controlling for, uh, for example, this, which was, um, do we have one person proposing 100 streets? Uh, we had one person proposing 32 versions of a street, which was a little bit strange, uh, but maybe it was because they kept on going and uh, then we had another one who was doing 13, another one 11, another one uh, 10, and then some others. But we really didn't get like one or many people doing several streets. Like this was the most uh, that we got sort of repetitions from the same computer, basically. So that was sort of to look at where, whether somebody who had a particular agenda was proposing something in particular, but none of that happened. This was done uh, throughout Septima, so the 16 miles of Septima. So we selected 12 locations initially along the street, but then we selected uh, three more. That's why you see sort of a, a, a smaller amount here in, in three of the segments because we, we added them later. But uh, this is sort of the, the amount of proposals that we got out of the, the different uh, people who participated. You can see that the first one has almost a thousand proposals, 978. And that is because the, 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 the website that we had where people would, would click began in this order. Like it said, 26th Street with Septima, then click there and then they could go to the next one. So of course, many people went directly into 26th Street, which is the one in the city center. Um, and that's why we got almost a thousand out of those. But then we get 396 proposals per section on average when you count all of those, but many of them are beyond uh, 300, uh, which I feel is great. Like I feel um, if you compare this with any other 
workshop that anybody has tried to do to get proposals from people that are concrete and very specific, you can't say you have 20 proposals for each section. Like it would, I would be surprised to see any exercise where somebody gets more than 10 in several sections where there are specific examples. Like uh, the alternative that you have to this is basically people telling you in words, like uh, I would like to have more trees or I would like to have a, a better sidewalks, but you, you never get like the potential to have people propose actual designs of a street. So all of these are actual designs of the streets. That's specifically what you can see in the case of, um, of, of what we did here. And I'm very proud of it. Like it, it's incredible, but I'm also, the thing I'm most proud of is that it's not just me who can do it. It's actually anybody can do it on their own. Like you need a programmer, yes. But you could do this from in, in your home. Like it, again, I sound like an, a TV advertisement, right? Like saying, hey, you can do this on your in your home. And you can do this in your home. Like really, you can. Uh, and I can tell you a little bit of how to go about that later. Um, okay, so again, sort of a little bit of numbers, how many proposals per day. Uh, the very, very big, more than 1,000 proposals that you see there is the day that it went on the newspaper. So the newspaper uh, publication did us a lot of good. We, we got beyond 1,000 only on that day. Uh, again, I'm thrilled. I'm really happy to see that. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I find it wonderful that people actually did uh, uh, respond to that. And I think I owe at least lunch to the journalists who did this one page spread uh, because it was really wonderful that they really paid attention and did a very good description of how to arrive at the website, how to go to the platform. And that really was great. Again, I would have felt better if we would have been able to go in person to many different places. But in the middle of a pandemic, uh, I really didn't feel like that was a good call. Like I said, okay, if this goes well, then we'll just do it someplace else again, and then we'll we'll correct that mistake of not doing so many in-person things. Okay, so what did we find? And please remember to ask questions. And there's there's a nice chat there where you can ask questions, or you, yeah, there's a question thing where you can see, or you can later sort of ask some other thing. Uh, so what did we see in the things that we did? Okay, before I go here, I'm going to show you more or less sort of the back end, sort of the, 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 the way that we uh, did this. Uh, so as I showed, like you have all these and people would sort of create something different. Like I could sort of, if this would be the street that I had, then I would say, so I, Carlos Felipe Pardo, because I'm, I'm obsessed about cycling, I would say, well, let's have a super cycle highway here. And I would build this. You remember the capacity of this street that we had here? It was 9,000, now it's at 52,000. And then I would say, let's put a tree here, but let's imagine it's this kind of tree. Uh, and then let's put this red because I want to feel that I'm in the Netherlands. And then sort of, I can do that very quickly. And then I can say, well, wait, but what about scooters? Scooters are now riding our streets and then we can put some scooters there. Take this AV there, put an AV here, another AV there, but then put it on the other side. So it's not like I'm a genius at the mouse. It's just really easy to use. So I encourage everybody to use the platform uh, and to go and, and, and play from your side. And okay, so then I also wanted to put in a, a little, table here to eat uh, and now I have 75,000 uh, capacity. If I'm less, if I prefer not the Tumi numbers, but the NACTO version, then I go to 46,000. If I prefer the city of Vancouver stats, then I go to 13,000. I mean, depending on how conservative of what your source is, I like the Tumi one because I work a lot in developing countries. So that's more better adjusted to that. And then so this is the kind of thing that we were able to do. Like we gave people the existing street and then they would design what they had. Uh, just the detours through like street mix, like this is the GitHub of street mix. I'm going to use the chat here 
so the people can go can oh I think we can only send it to to Christine but but you can you can go to the github of street mix if you know what github is if not then just get a programmer and tell them look there's this platform in github can I just deploy something similar to that and they'll say yes of course uh, uh, there's also documentation, really good documentation of how to contribute to Streamix to improve the platform. And then I'll show you how the streets look like. So this is the actual result of uh, what we did in Streamix. This is sort of a, um, zoom in. So the streets are basically, you have a hash for an ID, the IP from where it came from, the, the URL, the ID of the street where what is the crossing when did they do it what time did they do it and then a lot of characteristics of the street of the amount and width of everything that we had there like did it have stations did it have uh, buses did it have cars and then the total capacity and the total co2 emissions because we added also the co2 emissions of each of the streets so we had all this for each and every one of the streets that we that people were proposing and we could look at all of these individually and then based on that then i was able to to start working a little bit more on uh, the oh, this is huge on the different proposals that we had started doing averages starting doing the different graphs which would sort of summarize the the different results that we had from the street so i would like me uh, using these results, which were uh, sort of a very standard uh, um, uh, uh, spreadsheet and then producing graphs. So that was sort of the kitchen of what we were doing. But now let's see what came out of this and sort of let's first see drawings and then see some sort of the summary graphs. So we had people proposing magic carpets. I have no idea when they expect magic carpets to be in the Bogota Septima Avenue, but we had people proposing it. 235 of them had at least one magic carpet in their design. 248 of those, of, of, of all the streets had integrated uh, autonomous vehicles, which is also a little bit strange. Like uh, when did we promise that? Like it's fine, but we kept that in the platform because we felt like, okay, if people want to propose that, then it's fine. Let's let people propose what they want to see in the future of the street. So that was nice to see. Uh, and sort of a little bit of a, of, of a running joke. Uh, but when we started to do an analysis, sort of a very thorough analysis of everything that happened in the streets, then we started to find really interesting things. So I'm going to let you uh, read this and sort of let it sink in as I drink water. Okay, so because you read very quickly, you must have already seen everything. Basically what we saw, and this is a summary of every uh, segment along Septima, how it's distributed in terms of bike and scooter, walking in green space, individual motorized transport and public transport. So in summary, these are the widths in average of every segment today, the one above, and below you see how people were proposing that the redistribution should happen. So basically this is showing me how 7,000 people propose in average to reallocate the space in the street along a major avenue in a city. And they basically said, you know what? Increase the space for bicycles and scooters reduce the space for individual motorized transport so cars and motorbikes and increase the dedicated space for public transport take some of the space away from walking in green space because we need sort of to get it out of here but the main space that they proposed to take away was individual motorized that to me is a wonderful result to show that people in average, as a whole, are actually preferring to see public transport as a street reallocation. And I feel that that is sort of a very important thing that, that you can see out of this. And, and I also see that sort of this increase in the space for bicycles and scooters, the increase in the space for public transport is a fundamental thing 
in the case of, of what people are proposing. And it's not sort of people like me who are sort of the nerds of cycling and sustainable transport. It's just regular people who saw the newspaper. Like it wasn't uh, 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 only people from uh, like our sort of segment of the population. It was, it was really anybody who had an internet connection, which of course is a little bit biased because it is people who have an internet connection. But I feel that anyway, that is very positive. Okay, what else? Uh, uh, this is the same graph, but basically how they are distributed today, each of those, like every one of the segments, you can see that there's no public transport uh, dedication in, the, in, in many of the segments. You can see that there's no bicycle and scooter uh, uh, spaces in, the, in almost half of the segments. And this is how the proposed changes. So you can see the change from here to here, right? So you can see the increase in every segment of both blue, so bike and scooter and public transport, right? Uh, so that's pretty cool to my mind to see how you can really sort of summarize things so clearly. So that's in terms of the street reallocation. Now, in terms of, so yeah, this is again, the same graph, just showing the existing and the proposed. Oh, and the yellow is sort of magic carpet. Of course, not many people, I think you can see the, magic, the yellow uh, there, but it's sort of a slim, one percent but also we started to look at okay what about co2 emissions so what about the co2 emissions that the street has today which is the purple one how does that compare with the proposals and these people weren't looking at co2 emissions like they weren't sort of purposefully reducing co2 emissions they were just proposing how they thought the street should look like and that resulted in a reduction in co2 emissions which is also great. Like on average, the, the reduced emissions were five, six percent, and there's some which have a very high uh, reduction in emissions. And this had very conservative numbers of CO2 emissions uh, using an, a European standard for CO2 emissions of each mode. If we would have had enough information from the Bogota CO2 emissions, we would have been able to do another estimate and it would have been much lower, uh, uh, sort of it would have been much greater reduction in emissions because Bogota has a clean energy matrix. We have majority uh, hydroelectric and the, uh, the remaining proportion is in the thermal. So we actually have a very, very clean uh, 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 transportation system when we sort of improve in certain respects. But, but this was sort of, really interesting to see, even with very bad estimates of, of sort of very dirty, uh, let's say, situations of certain modes, uh, we anyway got a reduction. And then when we looked at capacity, again, people weren't proposing capacity, they weren't proposing something where they said, what I want is greater capacity. No, they were drawing a street. What we found is that the capacity increased on average by 45%. And in some cases, in one case, which was in 163 Street, it increased by 80%. So that's wonderful to see. Like, it is incredible how people just say, well, I would like to see this. And then you end up having an increase in the, in the uh, capacity of the street. This is with the Tumi estimates, which are the ones that correspond better with the, the situation in Bogota. Uh, OK. So what are the lessons that we found? Uh, we found that the activity had uh, a lot of participation. I mean, again, it would have been better if we would have had in-person, but we had thousands, like literally thousands of proposals, which I felt was great. Uh, the citizens proposed emission reductions and the higher capacity in the corridor. And more importantly, we found the Bogota is open to change, which for me was a great sort of lesson to, to use. And what did we sort of propose to government when we finished? We said, okay, you know what? You have to create, definitely create dedicated space for public transport, preserve and expand the space for walking, preserve and improve the spaces for bicycles, improve the public space furniture, green area services, and be creative with your design. If people are open to change, then be creative. I mean, just try it. Just try to do something super cool to see what happens because if people are willing to entertain the idea of having a magic carpet, then why not uh, think about something else? Okay, I'm going to show you some examples of how they change. So the, the picture above is 
the representation of the suite today, the picture below is the representation of how it's proposed. So you can see it's exactly the same width. People are doing changes in the same way. So this is how they propose a change in near the city center. It is a BRT, uh, which in Bogota many people don't like, uh, but it is a good thing. Like it is, it's a great system. Uh, so some people were proposing it. Uh, then let's see another one. This is 39th Street. So this pe these people were proposing tram, take all the cars out, all the buses out, just leave a tram, people walking in on bicycles, which is great, right? Then this one in particular is sort of this very sort of northernmost place in the city, doesn't have a lot of stuff happening, but then people were very, very sort of creative and producing something nicer. But then this also goes to show you like, how beautiful you can do a street just by changing a few things. Well, I know that doing a complete urban development in two buildings isn't just changing anything, but but sort of you have enough space to do a lot of things, right? And it is exactly the same space. This is a very low emission proposal, uh, 205 grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer, 80,000 passengers per hour. This is another very low emissions proposal. It even has cars, but anyway, it's very low. The highest capacity proposal of all was one which had only people walking and on scooters and a few on bikes. And the lowest capacity was one which had a magic carpet, only two people, 1,500 passengers per hour, and a food truck. That was it, the entire thing that they proposed. This wasn't counted as valid, but anyway, I just wanted to show that. This is one where they propose to tear down the tallest building in Bogota, which is would, would be to your left and replace it by a river or by an ocean. Anyway, the rest is valid, so we kept it. Uh, this is one where they propose the super cycle highway and no cars, no buses, no anything, just bicycles, bicycle parking, people uh, having lunch and other people walking and super high rise buildings, right? And then of course, uh, that's everything that we did in, in, in Bogota. Now, what we want to do, and then again, street mix is this open source thing, which anybody can contribute to, but what we want to do with them now is we want to go isometric. So we want to do, this is an image from something else, but I just wanted to show this because we want to do super cool stuff that can go beyond the 2D version. And we can either see the plan view or we can see an isometric version of the proposals that we do oriented towards urban planning. And then we've been talking through to street mix. We think it's possible to just do something similar to street mix, but in, in the sense of sort of uh, urban development kind of things, uh, we still have to develop that platform and that's sort of our next step, which I hope that some of you are excited about and want to ask questions around this, but uh, that was everything that I wanted to show you. Uh, today, I'm happy to solve any questions that people have to go back to anything that I mentioned uh, to show you some other things of what we're doing with street mix. But but for now, uh, uh, yeah, tell me what uh, whether we should open people's mics or or ask them to write their questions. Yep, they're typing questions in now, folks. Feel free. Um... To continue typing your questions in, um, what fun this is. <laughs> I could just get lost for hours doing stuff like this. Um, so first of all, just for some context, um, when we're talking about this like kind of free open source stuff, first of all, the technology division, hold on, let me put my webcam back on. I can't talk and do this at the same time. Okay. Here we go. So uh, the technology division had a webcast back uh, at the end of March um, that talked, it, the title was Get, GitHub for Planners. So it, it kind of talked about the all encompassing idea of, you know, these open source tools and some of the logistics, the legalities. Um, so be sure to revisit that session if you hadn't seen it already uh it's up on our our youtube channel so one do that um let's get into some of these questions <laughs> there are a lot of really good jokes coming in uh about the magic carpet that i appreciate 
Um, I know, so, okay, so why, why you find them, then let me, every time people talk about magic carpets, I have to tell them that I wrote this blog post saying how magic carpets could change the way we think about transfer policy. So I'll paste that on the chat. I mean, I'm getting like Star Trek references, transporters. Oh, so so uh, so one thing. Sorry, I could I could I just get really excited. <laughs> the periodic table, which I'm going to paste the ch uh, in the chat as well, is another project that we did, which I was talking about. It's also on GitHub. I can send you the GitHub later. Okay. I, don't know, I can I can actually find it as I get those over and send those to folks. So so that. So what we do here is basically that we we are choosing, for example, the the pedestrian. So uh, if I go here and say I pedestrian, then my periodic table says, oh, this vehicle is not likely to be harmful. And then it sort of describes something. But then let's say that I want to see whether the DeLorean would be allowed. So we went and saw the movie, looked at this characteristics of the DeLorean, what is the top speed, like we saw everything and we concluded the platform told us that it would be very harmful. Now, yeah. uh, we used Keaton's Batmobile. We have nothing from Star Trek. We have the Toothless Dragon, if that's okay. useful. It is very harmful. We have many elements, but yeah. So the Jetsons flying car, for those of you who are so yeah, so you That's can play really around funny. with that. Like this is humorous. <laughs> I can't get into this. Very good. <laughs> oh goodness, look at all that. Yeah. So yeah, so happy to solve more questions. I mean, because I could continue just showing you the stuff that we're doing here, but happy to solve. <laughs> I think more. people would be okay with that. Okay. Um here we go. Let's get into some of these meaty questions here. Um the oh, a link to the Mo Mobility game. Oh yeah, of course. If you can type that in, it. and then, and if everyone, um, I've been copying these links over uh, in your chat function is where you can get all of these links that I'm that I'm copying over. Yeah, and then and then just it will take me a, a short while to get there. But so mobility is a card game that we have in English, we have it in Spanish, and so basically. You, I mean, the link, the first link that I pasted, or that I guess Christine is going to paste, it has sort of a description. You can you can do many things. You can download the PDF and get it printed in the print shop. You can uh, fill out a form that will take a, some time for me to check and then send you an actual deck. Or you can request access to this, which is the digital version of the game, which has the entire game sort of... Uh, it, it, it's all in a Google Slides format, uh, but yeah, so it's, so it's pretty cool. Also, and it's sort of an apples to apples or mm -hmm. cards against humanity kind of thing, but for transportation, uh, where you can also find a magic carpet and other stuff as well. Wonderful. So yeah, so, Thank you. Yeah. Good stocking stuffers. Okay, so here's this question. Um, I work primarily in parking uh, transportation demand management and shared mobility. Is there a way to use Street Mix for communicating, visualizing, and soliciting curb management strategies? Yeah, I think so. So, of course, I mean, there are, okay, not entirely, I guess, is sort of the, the more accurate answer. You can sort of change your, you can change this to many different things, but then there's a parking lot here, for example. You can, so basically what you can do with Street Mix is you can, you can make people draw the kind of thing that they want to see very easily. Uh, and it has a lot of street elements from curb to curb, right? So that includes parking, off-street parking, but it also includes on-street parking, right? So you can have those elements of the street added. Uh, it depends on what uh, the person who was asking meant by having sort of this to become sort of a, a, a advice on the curb. Like I would think it is a good way. Like what I feel is because you can very easily present an argument visually, then I feel it would be a useful way to say, well, 
what do you want to do in the curb? Would you want to put parking or would you rather put a food truck or would you rather put something else, right? And then that could help me in saying, well, look, this is how it would look like with off street. This is what it would look like if I actually develop a five floor uh, building here. Like those kinds of things are very easy to do. And again, like anybody, like literally anybody can do it. I feel really like I'm on, on this sort of TV ad, but literally anybody can do it. I, I got my son who is, okay, when he was 10 years old to sort of play around with it. And he was like, in two minutes, he just redesigned the street like exactly how he wanted. So I feel that it is a very potent way of showing certain things. In terms of curb management, sort of like the, ne the next step, what are the implications of different curb management strategies? Then you'd have to do something different. Like you, you could uh, uh, draw it here, like visually present it here, but you, you, you I mean, it's, uh, we'd have to think about how that could be used sort of more thoroughly as a policy advice tool, which is not only the visual side. So yeah, I think I didn't answer the question, but at least I talked somewhat interestingly around the curb. Thank you. Um, we're going back to mobility for a moment. <clears throat> Have you had, uh, are you aware of any success using the board game or using the, um, the card yeah, game? Yeah. And yeah. this person writes, um, I've had some success using the board game Suburbia to tie planning and design concepts to, to gameplay um, features. Um, if anyone has played Suburbia, I got it for Christmas a couple years ago. It's hard. Um, the instructions are very complicated and you have to kind of take notes. Um, but oh, I, mean, it's, it's I had problem. never You've heard, heard of it. it? it no, but, it, but, pieces, this, but it, it, it looks great. Okay, so so about games. So we've I, I've started to work much more around sort of, uh, okay, I have a presentation about games, but I'll just give up and just talk about this. <laughs> um, the, the, main, the main sort of thing around games, and, and this is, closely tied to StreamMix because actually the, 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 Lu Huang, who is the one who developed StreamMix, uh, developed it thinking about games, like about video games and how that could be translated into planning. So it makes a lot of sense to talk about this. Uh, so the main thing about games is that they are uh, circumscribed in time space, they have their own rules, and you can you can simulate a reality without huge risks. And that's why we also did more mobility because we said, okay, we don't need to lecture anybody. We've been lecturing them enough about all this. We need to be able to playfully talk about these things, right? So when, when you look at mobility, for example, we have like, okay, pay attention to these uh, light bulbs. So we have some which are actually sort of dead light bulbs. So drones as transport, cancel public transport, elevated highway for cars. But in general, we're not trying to be super sort of insistent on what people are doing or what they're choosing. And the whole game is about persuading others to just pitch their idea as persuasively as possible to achieve a goal, right? So, so the, the main importance about playing games is that you get that opportunity to get people to sort of discuss things and to actually say, well, I want a sled in my city because then I can have a sled lane or I can have a, a lane for Volvos only. And then you can sort of playfully discuss and sort of be very explicit about why that would be ridiculous or why that would be useful or how that would benefit somebody else. Uh, and sort of you go around these different goals, which are the ones that you have to be aiming at. So for example, you can say, well, let's have a dystopian city. Uh, what would achieve the goal of dystopia? better and then people will choose something like that so so I, and then so i have not answered the question which was whether i saw any success we've used it every time that we have a pilot so we went to pittsburgh and then that that was the first activity that we did with all the people uh, who were part of the consortium and that opened their minds up significantly so that we could start the workshop and sort of having a broader understanding of what we could do so that was basically what we were trying to to achieve and i think that was very good and every time that we have a workshop that we have something where we're, we want to 
open people's minds towards something that is new, this game has been very useful in, in achieving that. Uh, but I think we need more games. Like I think that, that the, the, the potential of using games is great. And thank you for that recommendation of Suburbia. I haven't, I didn't know about it. And then we have this collection of uh, sort of different tools. That, and so I'm going to add Suburbia to that as well. And there's a few others that I can share later because I'm really got bad at, uh, at finding things, but, but okay, yeah. Okay, more questions. All right, next, let me pull this one back up. Um, here we go. Let's talk cost. Is there a cost for uh, municipalities or a company, whoever, to use this program? Is it completely free? Are there add-on type things? that costs money, no. talk to us about okay. that. Okay, so so you you don't have to pay Streamix to use it. Like, so you can see in the in the actual GitHub is it has a license and then it says like basically use it, <laughs> period. But so you don't have to pay a fee to Streamix. If you want to deploy your own version, you do need to get a programmer to help you in deploying it in your own website. Okay, so if, I think the one that we had is still working, but uh, so okay, not 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 working anymore. But um, these are 173 people who have produced their own versions of Streamix, successfully or not. But they've they've tried and they've they've sort of done it. And basically, what they've been able to do is take that and deploy it into their own website. You can, so what we did, for example, in the case of this specific one in Numo is that we did one very specific version, which only had the 15 segments of the street. I, as Numo, had to pay programmers to deploy that. I, got, I had to pay their hours to deploy that. And your commitment to street mix is to give it back to them, like to give back to them the, the thing that you produced, right? So the very short answer is there's no cost in terms of fees that you have to pay the street mix. You do have to credit them depending on how you use it. And you do have to pay somebody to do it unless you know it by heart how to program, but it doesn't cost you. Because you can call me, for example, and say, hey, can you help me? And then I'll say, yes, I have some time available because Numo is sort of about doing these things. And then I'll recommend a few programmers who can do this. But it's really straightforward. You just need somebody, well, just, but you need a programmer who knows uh, Node.js, which is a specific type of JavaScript, and they will tell you, yeah, we have to pay for the hosting, the domain, whatever, like a hundred dollars for a year, and whatever they charge you for programming this. I won't tell you how much I paid for the programmers because I would, I was using programmers in Bogota, who were very cheap, so I won't tell you because then you'll say, oh, you're whoever you get here in the U.S. will tell you, oh, this is very expensive. Uh, but it is pretty cheap to develop like now what we are doing now is we're getting to we're producing our sort of a, a much easier way of having what i showed you here as part of street mix so that people can deploy it on their own like that's going to cost us a significant amount of money to get that deployed but we will also push it into the github of street mix so it will be available for everybody uh, so yeah so, so in summary you don't need to you need to pay anyone if you already have the know-how of, of doing the, the coding there, then anybody who programs, who knows GitHub will, will sort of tell you exactly what that means. Uh, uh, and feel free to sort of reach out to me as well for that. Okay. Um, there are a lot of people really excited about the potential for going isometric here. So we have some questions uh, around that. Um, do you foresee um, which improvements to street mix are needed? Like aside, you know, from the talk about going uh, isometric, could information be added about distance between intersections, presence of driveways, um, transition lengths? Uh, can you constrain right of way widths? Um, okay. Yeah. So you everything that you line? said. So everything that you just said can be done. The thing is that, so it, it, so I've learned from working with uh, graphic designers and, uh, and programmers that 
the sentence it's possible does not at all mean that it's quick or that it's easy it means it's possible right so you can add many characteristics to all of this you just need to know how to do it very specifically and to be able to deploy it without mistakes right so so for example what we did here is in in our version of street mix uh, we added to sort of capacity we also added co2 emissions we fixed we so if you if you see here you can change the width we we took that out we just didn't allow anybody to change the width but you can sort of add additional layers of complexity you could say uh, uh, this has a green concrete and this is a red concrete and then show me what that means in terms of maintenance costs whatever like you could do that additional layer doing it would take you a considerable amount of time but because you already have this deployed then it wouldn't be a huge undertaking right so that is one thing like that 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 is one thing of what you can do beyond street mix like our boss harry trogoning at numo uh, once said well why don't you do something about uh, water management in the street right so and you could do that like do a new layer below this sort of to say okay what is my entire strategy to to manage everything that is happening underground right including an underground system but but everything else like the the, the utilities like everything you could do that as well it, it is sort of you just have to imagine how much more complicated it would be to program but it is possible to do and thankfully street mix itself is pretty or well organized in terms of programming so you need you need two people a person who knows what they're talking about in terms of content and the other person who, or three the other person who knows how to program and the other one who knows how to draw it the nice thing is that for example street mix if you go here it says it has the entire sort of description of the design principles of street mix which is super thorough like you can like i, I really love these people they, they're wonderful in being very thorough in everything so then like can you what uh, contrast works like everything is super cool in terms of how to draw things specifically for streaming so you have a lot of guidance of how to do that uh, so that's sort of a first very general answer in terms of what is possible now in terms of the specifics of the plan view which we have called plant view because in spanish it's called it's literally said like the literal translation is plant view and we did this mistake so many times that i said well just forget it it's going to be called plant view and so we've we've streamix has come up with a vision of how this looks like it started to see sort of different uh, platforms that are already doing similar things to that and and sort of even this nice toy which is called a uh, townscaper which is actually a toy to sort of draw i don't know if I can, okay you can see it here so it shows you sort of how to do an entire town out of a i don't remember where you click but you can actually play oh it's now it used to be free but uh, that kind of thing is what we would like to do something very easy to use and to to be able to sort of produce something like uh, sort of uh, based on many games which are following sort of uh, uh, this isometric view uh, to produce sort of uh, different things so you can see that there's games which have come up with ways of sort of putting trees and putting these animals there but you can do this sort of in terms of doing something for street mix we just haven't begun because we need to fundraise for it which of course translates into a pitch for any funding that you find uh, because we're already excited but let's look like like i'm very happy to talk about these things and again we want to do this in such a way that it becomes open source as a part of uh, github which we can deploy and anybody else can help in deploying this further right but yeah it is possible it, it would be great we're actively looking for funding to do it uh, uh, and we'd like we know with the royal we <laughs> of people who have been involved in the larger effort know uh, uh, how it can be done we just need to sort of find the time and money to do this but but yeah it, it's possible and happy to entertain the idea further so all of the work that's been done so far has been done through grants or just foundations or just private funders yeah do you do any so, advertising how, how <laughs> Where do you get okay. the money? Okay, so 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 that question is so okay. So I'm Numo, I'm not Streetmix. I would love to be 
one of the founders of Subix. I'm not, but I, but I, I just came in late. <laughs> so the, the support is after seven years of operation. The way that Street Mix works is you, you could donate to them. They have like that link to donate somewhere. Uh, like if you want to just donate through the open uh, collective, um, you can directly support them as we've done. Sort of the ones who have supported them have been uh, well, Code for America because they began as a Code for America project, which was then a spin off as a, as a company. Street Mix is an LLC. We then have been supporting them. Mozilla has sponsored them as well. And then you can sort of go there and, and, and sort of do your own donations. So that's the way that uh, Street Mix is starting. It, it has worked. They are creating sort of other versions of how to support Street Mix. And, and, and sort of that will be related to sort of when you log in, what do you get? Uh, I think they don't have a specific goal of doing any advertising just because it's sort of part of the philosophy of, of the whole thing. But I mean, in the end, it is, uh, as every open source project, it is a fragile project, but it's a fragile project that has existed for eight years now. But 2013 to today, yeah, eight years. So that means pe people must have been supporting them. Uh, uh, and it, it sort of, it works as is. It doesn't need a lot of support to continue running, but it does need support to sort of keep on improving everything. Like every time that something changes in Google Chrome, then something will go wrong, like that kind of thing. Uh, but it is, it is not a for-profit endeavor. There are other companies which have, used sort of the kernel of Streamix, the very early version, to deploy their own for-profit version. Uh, but that's a different thing. Like Streamix is open source, free for everybody to use, and then you can donate or should sort of support them in different ways. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Bogata and the use of, of Streamix. Um, the participation, um, how how did how were we able to ensure equal representation um, from folks that may not have access to internet or devices? We were not. Okay. So so yeah. So that's that's. I have to be very blunt. Uh, in the middle of a pandemic, with somebody calling me on the fifteenth of September to say you have to deploy on the first of October. I needed to make very specific decisions. One of the decisions that I made was. I will not collect any data from anybody who uses the platform other than their IP, because if I want to do so, I have to go through a legal process of verification of the privacy implications of the information I was collecting. So because Streamix is based in the US and we were doing something in Colombia, we didn't have a complete understanding of, of whether we were complying with all the sort of the, the the what what is in the what is in Europe the GDPR in Colombia is a specific law, so it would it, we would be still discussing that. So I said, okay, we will make the mistake of not collecting information from of people regarding their gender, race, age, where they live, and these kinds of things, because we had this very specific effort of not being privacy prob problematic in terms of the privacy. So every time I give this presentation, I have to clarify. And that's why at the beginning I say, this is what we did. Uh, we we only got the IPs from people. We we didn't get anything else. Not because we felt it was, it was a good way to proceed, but it, because it was a fair and legal way to proceed. If I would have had more time, literally, like if I would have had two more weeks, I guess, I would have even tried to do some authorization. Should have when you go to the when you go to the version of Streetmix in the the official one, you can sign in. The moment you sign in, you're providing information from the platform that you're signing in. So it, it sort of looks at the, whether you're registered in Twitter and what Twitter knows about you. We can, we we deleted that so anybody could could access the platform without signing in, because we knew that signing in would be an obstacle to participate. Now, the obvious thing is exactly what this person was asking, which is, we don't know whether there is a bunch of nerds that love, just, just to say the more com complicated question, we don't know whether there was a bunch of nerds who love BRT that were proposing a lot of BRTs. 
first of all, they didn't propose a lot of BRT. The majority of the mass transit was rail. Uh, but we don't know that either. Is it a bunch of people who sort of started WhatsApping themselves saying, well, let's participate here. I, I'm i confident in, in, in thinking that we did have a broad enough participation because we saw the, the behavior of the participation was very clear in terms of when we published things in several outlets, then we would get a spike uh, in participation. So when we got the El Tiempo, which is the major newspaper in the country, then we got the majority of the participants. And, and sort of that is sort of one of the things that lets me sleep at night, or at least present this without being completely embarrassed. But, but I'm, I'm, and, and the other thing that it would have done in, in terms of improving representation was that, and that I proposed this to government, but it was very difficult in the middle of the pandemic to do just because they were strapped for staff and just COVID. I wanted to do in-person workshops where actually people did not directly operate the computer, but they just looked at a screen, a very large screen where they were projecting things and they would point at what they wanted to do. And we would say, okay, there's 30 people here. Let's come up with the street that you 30 are proposing. And then we would say, well, this is 30 people proposing this. And that would help us in not only reducing the obstacle of not knowing how to use a computer, it, having internet, using a mouse, and sort of dragging and dropping. Like Those are many obstacles, right, to many people. But also we would focalize in the places where we knew that there was bad internet connection connectivity and lower income population. Because people who get the printed version of the El Tiempo newspaper are not the lowest income. So that was sort of one thing that I pitched government and they said, well, we can't do it. I mean, it makes all the sense in the world, but we just can't go and do a, a, a workshop with lower income population, which are the greatest, the greatest at risk for COVID contagion and just tell them we'll just sit here and start screaming at a screen. Like every, every risk factor was there, right? Like talking, uh, being in a closed space, like all that was, was sort of made it impossible to do, but, but that's what I would have done, like the authorization of the privacy thing. I would have done in-person workshops. Uh, uh, yeah, that, those would be the sort of the two main things I would have done to improve it. So we can't say that this is representative or that it is mathematically or statistically super reliable, but we can say that we got 6,000 valid proposals, uh, which is much more than uh, the, re the reactions of the NIMBY, powerful, uh, close to microphones population in our city, which were just destroying every other proposal that we had for the avenue, I guess. Yeah. So um, to continue on about making sure that there's kind of equal representation, um, for the people that use the street or utilize the street in question. You mentioned that uh, a barrier for people to participate, maybe not a barrier, but something that would dissuade them would be to have to log into the program. Is there a way to ask them when they're doing this just to put in their address? Like you don't have to log in, you don't have to put in your email, your phone number, yes. just your right. address so that you can at least ping and know okay, this person right. lives on that street, or the majority of people who, you know, submitted responses, they don't even live near here. You know, is there a way to, to do that just to right. the, 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 So in Colombia, we don't use, like we have zip codes, we just don't use them, period. But that would have been one way to say, well, put your zip code here. Uh, if, if we trust them, we would have said, well, yeah, that's true. And then that's yours. We could have done that, for example. Uh, there wasn't any easy way of, of doing this other than the very large boroughs. We have 20 boroughs. So we could have said, well, tell me what your borough you're in. Mm -hmm. uh, any additional click would get you less participation. That's sort of a main concern. Uh, so it would have been, it would have been nice to, to sort of have more time, greater publicity and have a login because the login already gives you, like you cannot imagine how much information you get from just saying login through Twitter. Like you can get like a scary amount of information. So that would have been wonderful in terms of collecting. Separate webcast. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna need to know more. 
<laughs> yeah, because because the, the the privacy of the privacy pr implications of doing that are 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 problematic, but you can correct for that. And when so the main thing is when you get more than two two things from somebody, you know you can almost identify exactly who they are. Right. So, so that's sort of the main concern. Like in normal, we have this very long discussion around privacy and how to preserve privacy. So then we were very uh, uh, sort of, yeah, that, that, that's sort of something that for the next one will be, will be happy to find a way to, to do it. But for this time, it was sort of like, we have to focus on programming the hell out of the mm -hmm. new platform, getting this deployed, getting people to participate and give the disclaimer every time at the beginning. It's not representative. This is what we got, but we got a bunch of proposals, and we know that this is better than what we're getting out of the NIMBY sure. uh, radio people just going on radio and saying this is not what the city wants, right? Right, right. Okay. Um, you did, I think you made mention to one example where it wasn't a valid submission. It was silly. Mm. I might be making that up. I don't know. Um, so what what metrics do you use can you use to um filter out the bad proposals right. so, essentially so how, how do you determine what's right you know what's good useful and what's not so so we got 7000 and something total right and the the easiest way to do to do the filtering, of course, we're, we're going to automate this for the next one, but the easiest way is to sort of say, how many trees do you have? And when you go beyond, uh, let's say, six trees, something's wrong, right? Like, so we would find, okay, I'm just, I'm just worried that I'll damage this database. But if I would go here and say, how many uh, magic carpets? And then there were people who were having like uh, 17 magic carpets. So that's sort of one thing that we did. We, we started filtering those which had a very high amount of anything because it didn't really make sense. If you have more than two BRT buses, but do you have per lane, then something is wrong. And then some people would have like 16 parking lots. And they were like, why? 12, uh, uh, and the same in terms of the, the minimum amount. So for example, I showed uh, the, the one with the lower capacity, which was invalid. And so this one, like we knew, like if you have only one uh, uh, magic carpet, then it doesn't work. And then we also were looking at, well, we were we were sort of doing filters in terms of amount of each of these things. And then the programmers helped me in doing something much more elaborate in terms of what what made sense sort of in, in the in the complete street, in the in the full street from facade to facade. Uh, and they would filter those out. So that was sort of the main process that we followed uh, in addition to sort of having the IP control because I showed the IP control, which was sort of looking at how many people were logging in from a specific IP. And um, and then we found out that it wasn't so much. So thankfully we didn't get a lot of either strange or, or just uh, hacks to the to the streets um, we did get a couple of days where somebody hacked into the official one and changed the dimensions of the streets and that was problematic but uh, for the rest we didn't get sort of big big problems and, and, and that was sort of the the way to control for those things but but if, if we do something larger then we're going to be controlling much more those kinds of things okay um capacity calculations mm -hmm. yeah this question here uh the capacity calculations well first she said this is super cool <laughs> the capacity calculations are really compelling but folks will say there's no way we could have twelve thousand bikes per hour in san diego so yep. how do you have those follow-up conversations with your municipality and community members Right, and that, that's a great question, like, and and that's why we emphasize always when whenever I I do this presentation to sort of uh, not brilliant people like you, but but rather sort of when we're sort of doing a big press release or whatever, I always say this is capacity, this is not demand, and 
despite that still sounds strange and sort of people will say, what, 12,000? No, uh, I, I always explain this a little bit further. What we're saying is what would be the theoretical maximum amount of people who could travel along the street, which is different to say, what are the amount of people who are riding along that street? Of course, immediately people say, well, that's a theory. And then of course that's a theory, but it gives you the maximum. So if you have a maximum of 9,000 in the Cloquet Avenue that I just came up with here, uh, just looking at random streets, if I have a maximum of 9,000 when I have only cars, and I have a maximum of 70,000 when I have a mix of modes, then that theoretical capacity is very useful in terms of saying, whenever I have a higher demand, my street will be able to take those trips, right? And I always do that clarification. I can't say the demand of a street here because I'm not talking about a specific street where I have a model to estimate the demand. That is a different process which actually engineering firms do. Again, that could also be integrated here, but we are here just focusing on capacity. And, and that's why also we use the, the to me, and I think this link, okay, you can go to this link and then sort of see where it's coming from and where they're doing it. You can see the NACTO one, which is the, tra the transit street design. And you can sort of read there where, and the Vancouver one is here. And you can sort of read there in each of those, what are the specific assumptions that they're following in their case? In some cities, uh, people uh, have done the math. So street mix is active and like we began with the to me one. Uh, uh, and then people said, no, that's not the one. You should use that the one. And I said, well, let's use all of them. Like let's integrate all of them. Let's say, well, let's if you if you want to follow the NACTO model, then follow it. If you want to see Vancouver, then follow it. If you want to see to me, then also follow that. But just we have very clear sources and a very clear potential for up to right so the estimated average okay this capacity i have to change that wording with street mix because it says estimated average traffic that shouldn't be there but but it is the the, the maximum capacity that the street can hold and and that's what we are what we are presenting it is not the demand right so that that's that discussion is is it always happens every time you use this so it's great that you ask because it is sort of a persistent question when we when we have these presentations and when we talk about this so three minutes left all right so here, here's my last question so um you mess around with the tool you um release it out to your community and let them submit all the proposals and then all of a sudden you get this huge spreadsheet of lots of data. What do you do next? How do you, how ha, so, did you, in, in your case study, um, how did you present the material, the results back to the community? What, what were the next steps? Right, and thanks. I, I should add this to the presentation to show sort of what happened next. So, so I presented this to the mayor and and we did a, a, a broadcast of the results and then we, we published the results. Uh, I think we even got an El Tiempo thing, but, but we, we did sort of broadcast the results to, to, to people through the channels of the government. And the government is using this as a basis for the designs that they're going to do. But the important thing is that they're not going to do like a specific design of the ones that that they got from here right they're not it doesn't mean that along 37th they're going to do brt and then on 163 it will magically become a rail rather the, they're using this as a basis to say well look people are in favor of having a redistribution of the streets where cycling has a role where public transport has a role and where they're open to change, right? Like those are the main things. And public transport is integrated into the designs. There's one thing that they're not adopting, which is the specific technology that was proposed in the designs. So when you look at it more closely, you will say, okay, 72% or something were proposing rail-based technologies and the remainder were, were proposing bus-based technologies, right? And they said, well, look, thank you. But what we needed to know was 
whether public transport was seen as a priority, not the specific technology that they would like to see, because the specific technology has implications of costs and of capacity and of a bunch of other things sort of in terms of the, the integration of the rest of the transport system. They could have integrated that if they wanted to, uh, but they technically they prefer to just sort of go with the, the broad uh, argument around public transport as a category rather than the specific technology. But, but the city is now doing the digital designs with this as one of the inputs for those designs. So yeah, so that's what's happening now. So it is good to see that this was not just a bunch of drawings that we ended up saying this was great. It is being used by government to, to actually do the designs. And we ran out of time, but I am happy to answer any other questions either here I, or, or later. I put my Twitter handle here in case people want to. Yeah, there were there are still quite a few questions that we didn't get to. Uh, so folks, feel free to reach out to Carlos with the remainder of your questions. And we hope, um, here, let me send this to everyone. Make sure you copy down all those links that I've been sending out in the chat function. Um, so as a reminder, we're recording this session. We'll post it on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast Series and we'll pop up. Uh, we'll have a PDF copy um, of the slide deck on our webcast webpage. Don't forget to log your CM credits. Carlos, thank you for joining us. This was fun. Um, and okay. thanks to the technology division. Um, don't forget to review the previous session on GitHub for Planners that was at the end of March. Um, I think that's it. Everyone, hey, have a great weekend and we'll talk next time. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.